let's just turn to uh, the Lord in a word of prayer before we turn to look at this portion of God's word. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we thank you that we can come into your presence and lift up our praise and our worship. We can come to you as we come now to hear your word, that Lord you might help us to hear, to understand, help us to apply your word to our own hearts. Stir our hearts, we pray, that it may be good soil to hear the word of God and that it would grow and bear fruit in our lives. Father, we again thank you that we can come together uh, as different churches to celebrate and remember uh, the death of our Saviour. We thank you for Jesus coming into this world in order to redeem his people. And Father, we have such a wonderful, wonderful Saviour, a wonderful message to proclaim. And Lord, as the Saviour is lifted high around the nation, indeed the world this evening, we pray that many would be drawn unto him. Father, again, we ask that you would forgive us for our many sins as we turn to your word now. We ask that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn to uh, John chapter 3. It's a well-known uh, passage, a well-known portion of the word of God. I don't intend to uh, be very deep or anything this evening. Um, I just want to bring a message that I hope will stir our hearts uh, and cause us to uh, think about uh, God and his amazing love, as we were singing about in that hymn there, the amazing love of God. We're introduced in this chapter to this man Nicodemus and Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and he asks him, Rabbi, uh, we, or he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. The miracles that Jesus was performing, uh, the healings that he had conducted, the raising uh, of, uh, to life of those that were dead, all speak of Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of God. And uh, Nicodemus recognised that, and he comes and makes that statement towards Jesus. But Jesus doesn't congratulate him, does he? Does he? he doesn't say, well done, that's, that's good, I'm glad you've seen that. Jesus simply says, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is this. That's all well and good, Nicodemus, that you recognise that I've come from God, but that's not enough. There's more. You need to understand more. There's more that you need to do. It's a little bit like in James chapter 2 where James says, You believe that God is one you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Believing in God is not enough. And there are many people in the world today who will tell you that they believe in God, but that's about it. And I can think back to my own uh, childhood days that I always believed in God. I've been taught that there was a God from the scriptures in Sunday school, Bible class, and if anyone asked me, do you believe in God, I would have said yes. But that's as far as it went. It had no impact on the way that I live. So believing in God is not enough. Believing that Jesus came from God is not enough. One must be born again in order to see and un uh, enter the kingdom of God. Now, verse 4 tells us really that Nicodemus doesn't understand what it means to be born again. And so Jesus goes on to explain that to be born again is to be given new life by the Holy Spirit. We're born uh, of the flesh, but we need to be born again of uh, the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit causes us to be born again when he convicts us of sin and we come under conviction of the wrong that we have done 
when we come under the sound of the gospel and the call to repent of our sin, the Spirit enables us and gives us a desire to repent of our sin. He calls us to faith and the Spirit enables us to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus. And we are converted simply through the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is seeking to get Nicodemus to understand. But verse 9 again here tells us that he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. How can these things be? And Jesus turns to the Old Testament, to Numbers 21, to use uh, an example there to show him that uh, he, Nicodemus, must come to believe and trust in God's remedy for sin. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. God was unhappy with the Israelites. He punished them by sending poisonous snakes amongst them and many were bitten and many died. And they cried out to Moses for help and he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord told him to make a, a brass serpent, fix it to a pole, and lift it high. And all who looked at that brazen serpent uh, would be healed. Uh, they were to look, they were to trust in God's remedy. And those who believed and trusted in something that seemed so impossible uh, would be healed. And Jesus is saying he is like that serpent put up on the pole. He is... God's remedy for a greater issue and a greater problem and that is the problem of our sin and he is going to be lifted up on a pole on a cross and those that believe and trust in him believing that he's lifted up to deal with our sin to deal with the and he is the remedy of our sin will be eternally saved and so in this uh, discussion with Nicodemus uh, Jesus is seeking to bring Nicodemus uh, to be aware of his need to enter the kingdom of God and you need to be born again if you are to enter the kingdom of God. You can be close to the kingdom of God. You can be near to the kingdom of God without being in uh, the kingdom of God. And I think it is appropriate to ask ourselves uh, this evening at, our, at the start of our message together do we know what it is to be born again can we say that there's been a time in our lives when we've felt that work of the spirit convicting us uh, causing us to repent to see the enormity of our sin and our inability to rescue and save ourselves and has pointed us to Jesus and we have seen who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do and we've put our faith and trust in him some of us can look back many years and when that happened and we're so thankful to those who took time to share the gospel with us. Maybe some have been converted recently. Maybe some here this evening have never had that experience of trusting the Saviour and I would urge you to consider uh, doing so uh, this evening. Having explained to Nicodemus the, the importance of being born again, born of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus goes on to explain to Nicodemus why this is going to happen, why he is going to be lifted up uh, on a pole, as it were, so that men and women will look and see, believe, and indeed uh, be saved. And he speaks of various things in John 3, 16. Uh, first of all, he speaks about God. He simply says, for God. And it would be easy for us to simply read those words and move on uh, and look at perhaps more of what Jesus says. But I think it's important that we stop here for a moment and we ask ourselves, what God is Jesus speaking about? about well, what do we know about this God that Jesus is referring to 
there are thousands, if not millions, of gods in this world. And therefore it's important for us to stop and think, who is this God? I was listening on, or watching a, a debate on YouTube. Uh, I don't know why it came up. Uh, YouTube seems to know maybe what's going on in my mind sometimes. It was a debate between an atheist called Christopher Hitchens, uh, he sadly passed away now, and a, uh, I have to be careful the term, a person of colour, um, Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton very much involved in the um, civil rights movements, Martin uh, Luther King, and, and so on, and if ever uh, there's a, a shooting of a, a black a person of colour, sorry, uh, uh, this Al Sharpton uh, probably would be there in the media in one way or another. Uh, but I'm not saying that I would always agree with what he says, but at this debate it was, uh, does God exist? And Christopher Hitchens was given five minutes to put forward his case that no, God doesn't exist, but in those five minutes, all he did was rant against God. All the things that he didn't like what God did came out, and it wasn't just the God of the Bible, it was the Muslims and the Muslim God uh, as well, and other gods as well, and Al Sharpton, to his credit, simply said, well, you know, you, you never answered the question. All you've done is say why you don't like God. You haven't put forward any arguments as to the existence of God. And if you've ever read Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, he does the same thing. He lumps all gods together. And I can remember reading The God Delusion and saying, well, I actually agree with him here because he was talking about all kinds of gods that uh, we would not agree with. Here... Jesus is speaking clearly about uh, the God of the Bible. Jesus isn't lumping all the gods in the world, the Canaanite gods, uh, um, the Egyptian gods, and the God of the Israelites together. He isn't doing this. He wants us to understand something of this God. And we could be here all evening and much longer discussing all the different attributes of God. I just want to bring a few to your attention because uh, I think they have some bearing on the context here. Who is this God? Well, first of all, he is the only true and living God. You talk or listen to uh, the media and when they talk about gods, they're all on the same level. They all uh, teach similar things and they're all... Uh, real, true, and so on. But that's not what the scriptures teach. This is the only true and living God. All other gods are the invention of men's imagination. Now that's very controversial uh, to say that today, isn't it? Because uh, we live in a multi-faith society. But that's what the Bible teaches. There's only one God, one true and living God. And the uh, believers in Thessalonica were told, turn to God, this God, from idols to serve the living and the true God. He is a living being. He's not made of wood. He's not made of stone. He's not made of gold. He's living. He's active. He hears. He sees. He is able to answer our prayers. And indeed, he is in control of all that is going on in this world. This is uh, the true and living God. The second thing I want to just mention is that he is the holy God. And we use the word holy uh, quite uh, uh, frequently. Uh, it really means that uh, God is separate. He's distinct from everything else. There is no one and nothing in this world that is like our God. He is eternal, he has no beginning, he has no end, he is self-existing, um, if I can say it reverently, he doesn't need three meals a day or to eat uh, the five a day that we are encouraged to do. 
He is almighty and powerful. Um, he's sovereign. No one can thwart his plans. He is so different from us. And we really can't fully grasp how holy, how distinct and different God is to us. We are made in the image of God, but sometimes I think we often twist that round and think God is made in the image of man, and we tend to think of God like us, but that is not the case. The psalmist says, Psalm 71, Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? And the answer is, no one. He is holy, distinct, different, completely different from all other beings. The psalmist there leads us on to the third point I want to mention, and that God is righteous. He is the righteous God. Uh, when we talk of being righteous, when we talk of someone being righteous, uh, uh, Zechariah, the priest, was described as being uh, righteous and walking blamelessly. Uh, it doesn't mean that he is perfect. It means he has been declared righteous or his life is characterized uh, generally by righteousness. It doesn't mean to say he's without sin, he hasn't reached the state of sinless perfection or anything like that. But when we talk about the righteousness of God, it's completely different in, in one sense, isn't it? God is pure. He is without sin. He is without error. He never makes a mistake. He is righteous in all that he does. And he is of purer eyes than to behold evil. God does see evil, but he doesn't dwell on evil. He doesn't delight in evil because he is a righteous God. Psalm 11, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. God never changes. He is always righteous. If we can say it, he is always 100% righteous all the time. He never makes mistakes. Now, we can struggle with that at times, can't we? When something um, uh, comes into our lives, something that's unpleasant, sometimes we think, Lord, why? Why? Why me? Why now? Why so painful? But God is righteous. And we have to hold on to that because uh, he never makes a mistake. And we know that he works all things out for our good and our eternal good. And the fourth thing, just briefly, this God who is the only true and living God, the holy God, the righteous God, is also the omniscient God. He's all-knowing. He knows absolutely everything he's never learning and we never inform God of things he doesn't know when we pray we're not telling him things that he hasn't seen he doesn't understand we don't catch God and again say it reverently off guard by surprise when we bring our prayers to him he is a God who knows absolutely everything sure uh, the boys and girls here, uh, the folk at uh, Knock Evangelical Presbyterian are very, very clever and intelligent people, but we don't know everything, do we? Until you go onto Facebook or something like that, and then you discover that there are people out there who seem to know everything about everything. doesn't matter what they're, dis they're talking about, they seem to be the ones who know everything about the subject. We don't, do we? We don't know everything. And if we had time, we could turn to Psalm 139, of that well-known psalm that reminds us that there's nothing God doesn't know about us. How many times have you sat down today? You don't count those things, do you? God does. God knows those things. When we stand 
and sit down, he knows. When we go out from the house, he knows. When we come back, he knows. He knows why we go out. He knows why we come back. There's nothing that God doesn't know about us. And we can't get away from God. We can travel at the speed of light, the wings of the morning, but we can't get away from God. We could go out in the middle of night, out into the, the countryside where there's no street lights, where uh, darkness is, is more intense than in the city. God still sees us. It's like midday to God. He still sees us. He knows our thoughts. He knows the words on our lips. He knows every action. This is our God. This is the God that Jesus is speaking about. And there's so much more that we could think about as we come to look at this God. For God, Jesus says. But I want you to just bear those thoughts in mind. Because secondly, he talks about the world for God so loved the world now we may uh, differ in our understanding of what Jesus is referring to here but whatever our views are what a contrast there is between God and the world personally I think there's a a, a link here to uh, the Abrahamic covenant where God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonours you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When we think of the world, we think of people of different colours, different languages, different uh, 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 nationalities, different ages, we believe there are two sexes, male and female, and they are scattered through every country, every tribe, every language group. The world in which we live is so different uh, from one place to another. And when we read the newspapers, if we watch the TV news, what we see is that this humanity of which we are part is rotten and it is rotten to the, the core whereas God is holy pure and righteous Paul tells us that this world is full of people who are sexually immoral idolaters adulterers men who practice homosexuality thieves greedy drunkards, revilers, swindlers. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In Romans chapter 5, he talks about those who are ungodly, sinners, enemies of God. And really, the TV screens, the newspapers, only help us to understand more of what the scriptures teach us about fallen humanity and often don't we see uh, man's inhumanity to man the crimes that are committed the activities that go on in our world today just show us again how true the scriptures are uh, that tell us we are a fallen creature God is pure and righteous the world is the complete opposite, unrighteous, rotten to the core. That's just not a general statement. That's true of all of us as well. None of us are perfect. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sometimes we have done things that are, are horrendous, things that we wouldn't want anyone else to know about even as those who are followers of Christ we do things that we know we would be ashamed of and we ought not to do even when we say we love God we still do things that we wish we never did it's the human nature the uh, how rotten it is 
And of course we read of all kinds of wicked, evil things, not in far-off countries, but in this supposedly civilised country. There are uh, young children here, I won't go into great detail, but we see and we know, don't we, of the wickedness that goes on in the world today and even here in Christian Britain, even in Northern Ireland itself. And so there's a great contrast here. Jesus is seeking to show Nicodemus how wonderful, how unique and how different this God is to the world in which we live. Indeed, Nicodemus, so different to you and to you and me here this evening. He speaks about God. He speaks about the world. And thirdly, he speaks about love. For God so loved the world. When we contrast what we know of God, and we've only touched on a little of that this evening, and what we know of the world, and again we've only touched a little on that, it wouldn't surprise us if God just destroyed humanity, that God wiped humanity off the face of the earth because of man's uh, sinfulness and wickedness against him. We wouldn't be surprised if uh, John said, for God so hated the world that he did this, that, and the other. But he doesn't. God so loved the world, Jesus says. I like these little words that crop up in Scripture from time to time. That word, so, that little word, so, says so much, doesn't it, about God's amazing love. For God so loved the world, not just loved. I often uh, say to folk uh, at Consbrook, um, I love various things. Um, I love Luton Town Football Club, and we won today uh, against Notts Forest, and I hope we get promoted. I'm a rarity, because there's not many Luton Town supporters, um, but I am one of them. Uh, I love white Toblerone, and as you can see, I probably like too much white Toblerone. And it was my birthday uh, this week, and my, my mother-in-law bought me three white Toblerones. Either she loves me a great deal, or she wants to get rid of me uh, quite quickly. I don't know. And when I say white Toblerones, I don't mean those meter-long ones. I've never had one of those but the, the big chunky ones, not the small ones. Um, I love my wife. I better say that as well. Uh, now, if I said I love Luton Town and I love uh, White Toblerone and I love my wife, you would all think, now, what, what order is that? <laughs> what does he love the most? I'm wearing a Luton Town tie uh, this evening, so maybe I love Luton Town uh, uh, the most. We use the word love, don't we, so easily, so um, naturally. But it means different things, doesn't it? Uh, and here, this word that Jesus uses is used in different ways. But it, here, it's emphasising with that word so in front of it, the enormity, the depth, the kind of love that God has demonstrated uh, what kind of love is this that's what we're going to sing in a moment or two but it speaks of the the depth of God's love that here is this God who is a holy righteous a God who knows every last little detail about everybody in this world and yet he so loved the world. The enormity, the depth of that love. We can't comprehend it, can we? And Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in chapter 2. And he says, having shown the sinfulness of men 
that we are dead, spiritually dead in our trespasses and our sins, that we are lost, that we cannot rescue and save ourselves. He says, but God, being rich, abundant in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It's not just that God loves us. That's amazing in itself, isn't it, when we contrast him to ourselves. But he loves us with a great love. Not only has he uh, pardoned us, not only has he forgiven us, but he has made us to alive together with Christ. He has raised us up with him. He has seated us with him in the heavenly places. Uh, the blessings of knowing Christ as Saviour just go on and on and on. And all of these blessings come to us because of God's great love. It's not because of who we are. We're as bad as everybody else. I'm not saying we're worse. I'm not saying we're better. But we are all the same, aren't we? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God's amazing love has brought us to believe in Christ and has poured out his blessing upon us so that we are forgiven, we're reconciled, we are his children, and we are assured of heaven. John tells us uh, in 1 John chapter 4, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, uh, the, the sacrifice that turns away the anger and the wrath of God. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. God's love is so deep, so great, and yet it is a love uh, that can be seen. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Paul says, Christ died for us. And here in John 3, 16, uh, Jesus explains, For God so loved the world. How did God so love the world? That he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's amazing love is seen in that he gave the greatest gift that he could possibly give to meet our greatest need. He didn't have to do that. But he loved us. And he loved us so much. And he sent his son into this world to be our sacrifice, to pay for our sins, to be our substitute so that we will never be punished for our sins again. What a lovely uh, thought that is. And as we come uh, to a conclusion, I trust this evening, as we think about the depth of God's love, and as we compare ourselves to God, that we might be, as it were, wrapped up in the love of God, and that uh, that appreciation, that a desire to know more of the love of God may have a greater impact on our own being and our own lives so we might love God more and more above everything else that that love that God has for us might be, might be mirrored back in some greater measure than it has been so far and that we would love him more and more but as John said if God so loved us we also ought to love one another. That as we uh, think about God's love, as we experience more of God's love, that we might mirror that love back to God, but we might share that love towards one another. And that we would treat one another as God has treated us. He gave his greatest gift to
to meet our greatest need, that we might be those who love one another with that love that God has for us, and that love would be seen in uh, his people and in our dealings with those who are still outside of Christ. Christ was lifted up. We celebrate his death this evening. On this uh, Good Friday, we celebrate the fact that God loved me and he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes and rests and trusts in him and what he was doing, why he was dying, will be saved, will have everlasting life. May God stir our hearts to love him more and more as we grow in our knowledge of him and we see a greater sinfulness in our own selves. Amen. May God bless his word to us this evening. Now we're going to uh, sing in closing.